This is a Tamimi house um, in Nabisala. Nabisala is a village that took the settlement next door to court for taking their water. They won in Israeli Supreme Court, but because they're in military territory, the settlement gets to ignore the order and uh, the military drives them back into their village. They go out every Friday and protest. They've been doing it for, I think, 20 years. They've been arrested, shot, killed. Um, different people from different countries have come to be there with them and uh, we're meeting with them and that's a Canada shirt that we gave to them. They aren't actually really happy with Canada. Uh, because of some of the stands that we've taken, the United Nations and the support that we, we give. But they're happy, they're okay with us, they're just, you know, it could be better. We were walking up the hill to see, to look at the settlement. And I asked Mohammed, the younger guy in the picture, so where do you get hope? Like, what, what keeps you in this? How do you keep doing this? His uh, cousin had been arrested, she's like a poster child for Palestinian girls who've been, she's 14, 15, years old when she was arrested. She was kept for eight months. Um, like, how do you keep doing this? And he said, well, I have to. He said, once you become aware, there's nothing else you can do. When you have awareness, and I said, like, here. He said, well, there, but here, too. He said, I know what's going on. I can't not push back. I have to. But I'm doing it as much for the soldier that has to arrest that child as I am for myself. He said, because if you're going to arrest, there was a kid about that old, maybe a few years older that we walked by. He said, if you're going to arrest that child, Something has to oppress your head. Like, there's no way that you can actually do that as a human being without something taking you over. You, and so he said, for the soldier too, for him, I'm doing this for him too. He talked to us about a, he would, uh, was picked up by the British authorities and, and um, our British, by the Israeli authorities and held for a while. And he said there was this young captain who wanted to talk. And so he, the captain said, you, you, you want to be free, don't you? You don't want to go through this all the time. And he said, no, of course I, I don't want to go through this. Of course I want to be free. And the captain said, well, it's simple. And he said, well, how is it simple? What do we need to do? Um, because we, you know, we're trying to be equal and free. And the captain said, well, it's easy. Just move. Get out of here. God gave us this land. It's not your land. Go somewhere else. If you can do that, you can be free with the other Arabs, basically. And there's a lot of, they call it apartheid. If you talk to Palestinians, they say it's like, just like apartheid. Um, there's the settlement across the way from Nabi Salah. You notice, notice the roofs? We'll look at that a little bit later, but you know, Palestinian roofs are all flat. They have water tanks on top of them. They go out there and sun themselves. And, and, and this, I could, I'm pretty sure I could find a subdivision here. Uh, the well at the base of the hill is the one under dispute. They, they marched to that um, and then they, uh, there's an observation balloon, that's the Israeli military's way of you know, making sure that people aren't moving around too much, or if they are, they can dispatch forces to deal with them. So they collect the tear gas canisters and hang them off their fences. Just Some people carve them, they use them for spoons, earrings, things like that. Um, it's, just, it's just like a cloud of tear gas through the, through the village. Trees start on fire. There's one of the homes that's demolished. Uh, in Israel, or in the occupied territories, you can only build a home if you get permission. They got a way higher birth rate than Israelis do, and they need more homes. But you can't get permission because you have to go get a permit. But it's like a Kafka film. You can go and try and get a permit and wait five years for it to come out the other end of the system. You're never going to get a permit. So you build a home. So then they put your home under a demolition order and then they wait. Could be next week, could be next year, could be 10 years. They just wait and then they come and tear your home down. Not the one next door to you that's also under it. So it's this constant wear, uh, and that's one of the homes torn down. Another poem from the Arafat Museum. The old man, the crutch, and the stone will revolt. This is uh, Ahed Tamimi. As I said, it took until she was, oh yeah, 16, until she was imprisoned. What she said when she came out of prison was, I see peace as all of us living together without borders, without occupation, all of us equal. And I want to emphasize, that's what I heard from everybody I talked to. They saw an equal country. They didn't see two states. There's nothing left of Palestine. It has to be one state, but everybody has to be equal. That's what they told us. Um, and we have to have as much right and ability to live here as anybody else does. And we're not about throwing them into the sea, but we have to be equal. And they have to stop moving people here. Uh, military court watch. They specifically accompany children in military court. 
There's 700 kids, I think, 600 kids maybe in prison right now, in Israeli prisons. These folks go. Gerard is from Australia, he's a lawyer, uh, married to a Palestinian woman with Palest Palestinian family, and uh, talked about how internationally we lose uh, every time we accept that one state can take over another state and do what it wants to. As he said, this is not just an issue for Israel and Palestine, it's an Israel about, uh, issue about the rule of law and state law in the whole world. Um, it's very interesting as well as talking about what's happening to kids in Israeli prisons. He says, from his perspective, they get kids, they pick them up, they come in the middle of the night to your house. They open, they either kick the door down or they use a, a device that crushes the dams apart, um, a hydraulic device, so they can get in quietly. So you've either heard them coming or you wake up and there's half a dozen is young Israeli soldiers with some machine guns pointed at you while you're sleeping. And then you get up and they take you and they put you all in one room and then they take your children. They take the ones that they think were throwing rocks and they, they put them in the, the car and they lock them up. And they turn them. Um, and they turn them into, he says, informants, and, and they say, oh, you know, your mother will pay the price, or your sister will pay the price. And they do that to disrupt the village, because nobody knows who they can trust or rely on. And, or they'll offer them inducements, like your mom can get a work permit to go to Jerusalem. So he talked about the specific war on children as another tactic, but he also talked about, just overall, in international courts, whether even from a, a state perspective we want that to happen, let alone what's going on with kids. And this is Aida refugee camp in Bethlehem. You'll see some images over there, the key. And when they got to that refugee camp, there were uh, people from 26 villages. There were about 800 of them. They brought their keys with them because they were going home. They knew they were going to get back home again. And so the keyhole and the key has become a big image in that village, uh, or in that refugee camp, which is in Bethlehem, um, and has now about 7,000 people. They didn't go because they were told if they went anywhere else, they'd lose their right to return. It was our government and the UN that told them that. So they've stayed there, uh, some of them. Those are the villages that they came from, that they're determined to go back to. The kids there are also targeted. This is a picture of a young boy who was shot by a sniper just standing there. And they don't know why. They don't know what happened. It's a training camp, so the Israeli military trains uh, younger guards there. They don't know if somebody was just fooling around and accidentally shot this boy or if they're practicing a new weapon to see if it would work at a distance or what happened. And they'll never know. The parents aren't allowed to go to Jerusalem to take the military to court to find out. They can't get through the wall. So they just showed us that and, and wanted us to talk about the international community asking for justice for their kids. Now their kids do throw rocks at the Israeli army, they do. But it's a little different between a, a rock and a rifle. And international law, we were told by Military Court Watch, says that if somebody takes your country over and they've been there for 40 years, you can actually fight back. It's OK. You can, you can use some kind of method to try and get them out of your country. That's, it's actually a, a, allowed under the law. Um, so what are people doing to turn this around? Like, it's just awful. So what are they doing? Besides the resistance of being present in the court systems, these uh, two women are uh, part of a Peace Hero curriculum in a Jerusalem school where 85% of the student body is uh, Muslim, 15% Christian. And they're developing a new curriculum that gives people, kids, grades one to three Peace Heroes. Um, they said that's the age. They tried it with older kids, didn't take so well. But with younger kids who are totally into Marvel, Spider-Man, anybody like that, if you can show them somebody who's being heroic, they're all about that. They love that. So they brought them the stories of, of about 80 people throughout the world who have made a huge difference in their countries, in some way changed what was going on. And um, Ellie Pritz wrote the curriculum. She took her master's. She's a Christian Palestinian, uh, grew up in an Arab neighborhood, a uh, Muslim neighborhood took her master's degree in, in uh, Belfast in Peace and Reconciliation Studies, and then came here to Trinity Western University, because she's a Christian, and took her communications and English degrees there. And then went back home and wrote this curriculum. Would love to come here. She's been here uh, in Vancouver, 
and would love to you know, come and write part of the curriculum around Canada and around what we're doing. Susan Shahid's from, uh, Shahid is from Chicago. She's only allowed to be there for five years, um, and she's coming to the end of her time, but she helped make it manageable curriculum for classrooms so that it worked as teaching components and um, worked over a four-year program. This is one of the kids, Tanik, talking about his peace heroes. He had two of them. Um, they were, one of them was a Palestinian man who tried to get people to sit down and talk to each other, Jewish and, um, and Muslim and Christian. Another one was a, a woman in Egypt who'd given up a very good, very wealthy life to go work with the poor and do what she could to help change the lives and circumstances of poor kids living in slums. We asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he basically said, in a very clever kind of a way, I'm not old enough to figure that out yet. Come back in a couple years, he said. <laughs> right now I think I'll be a doctor, but who knows, when I'm 14 I might change that totally. So he said, okay, <laughs> come back then. Yeah. And Mira, uh, she was amazing. She talked about her peace hero was a woman from Ni Nigeria? No. West African woman who's, uh, who was the first woman to get her doctorate, who helped her country um, her country was not doing very well with its environment or, its, or looking after its poor people. Her government um, changed, her husband became part of the government, and she worked with them to change um, how they did things and got them to, uh, one of her programs was for the government to pay poor people 10 cents a tree to plant a tree. And so it got money in the hands of the, of the people on the ground and, and got trees everywhere well looked after. She, this woman, that as Mira's hero changed not only the environment of her country but also the culture of her country. She's an amazing woman. So we asked Mira what she wanted to be and she's got it. She's gonna be a space scientist, maybe with NASA, who knows. Those kids like are changing how they see the world and that program is helping them see how to change the world. And that was very hopeful. Um, one of the teachers from that school, Lisa, is going to be here on the 13th to talk about the kids that she's in relationship with and how she's seen them change. Khan al-Amar is a Bedouin village. It's been there since 1949, uh, since the government of Israel said the Bedouins could no longer range. They used to range. They had maybe three or 400 animals. They would go across the Negev, which is not a desert, but very sparsely planted. And so you have to range a long way away from your home village. So Europeans, when they got there, thought, well, there's nobody there. Actually, there were lots of people there, but they were off with their animals. Their animals fed their family. Uh, when they wouldn't patrol the Negev, they were forced to stay here. They've been there ever since. That village is now in a key communications corridor. Um, we saw the bulge in the belly. Well, if you extend out from that village, right through, it'll cut, that, cut the West Bank in half. And so there's a demolition order on the village to tear it down. And we went there and talked to, uh, with Angela, who's our guide, to Aid, who's the head man of the village. Uh, we saw the school, they built a school. The international community helped build it. It's tires and pounded earth, um, 150 kids. And they come from diff different little villages all the way around. And uh, it's one of the key points to, for the village to be able to stay where it is. So those kids are a rallying point for the international community. They've got a protest tent. People come and spend the night there. They've been under an imminent demolition order for, I think, almost a year now. And who knows if they'll, if they'll be torn down or not. They're on our church website as a, a place that if we could write the government and ask them to do anything, it would be to protest anything that happens with this village. And um, I think our prime minister did express some concern, which would be good. That's the protest tent where people sleep. It's just, it's difficult. One of the tactics that the Israeli government uses is high pressure water cannons, but they're mixed with noxious chemicals. So it's not like clear water, it's like. So that's their housing. Um, certainly not my housing, but it's their housing. And that's what, where they live and that's what they want to maintain. Uh, then we went to Afrat to talk to a settler. Uh, that, that's where Afrat is. It's like clearly in the occupied territory. It's in Palestine but it's little America. Uh, and so we met a settler named Artie. I just want to give you some shots of what that settlement looks like. And that's Artie. Artie was our, so our host. Artie's fiercely proud of, of his people and the plans that Israel has to 
continue bringing in more settlers and more settlements. When we asked him about occupied territories, he said there was nobody here when we got here. Uh, we had a war, we won, they lost. They tried to attack us. We were bigger, stronger, and smarter. Um, sucks to be them, they should just leave. Basically, very much more diplomatic than that. But he's from Chicago, and you know, people from Chicago can talk in a certain way, and Marty certainly can. Um, he really wanted us to know that the problem was the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian authority. Many Palestinians would tell you that. That's a problem. We don't like our leadership. We had an election in 2006 to change our leadership. Unfortunately, we voted for Hamas, and the Israelis wouldn't let them come in. They wouldn't let us change leaders. Uh, and so we're stuck with what we've got. And although our guide said, I don't really like Hamas, they're a fairly right-wing um, religious party, and I don't like them. But they'd be ours, he said, I will, you know, we can deal. He said, the reason people vote for Hamas is because the Palestinian Authority rolls over for Israel all the time. Um, they don't stand up. Hamas at least will stand up for us, because not standing up has gotten us nowhere. So, um, Ardi says the leadership's the problem. The leadership would say the problem is you moved in, took the highest ground in our area. You're moving in 30,000 more people. You're taking everything from us, and then you, you're telling us we were never here in the first place. That's what the problem is. Guard towers, like everywhere, I took a picture of a few. There's the Ibrahimi Mosque again. There's the seventh step. There's inside the mosque, Jewish side of the mosque. There was a massacre at the Ibrahimi Mosque in 1994. A Jewish settler an army member came in and shot and killed uh, 29 uh, worshippers in the mosque and wounded another 125. It's not by far the worst massacre that's ever happened there. Um, it's, and it's Palestinians, uh, Muslims have massacred Jewish people, Jewish, it, it, there's a history. But what happened with this one was that the mosque then became partitioned. And the people could no longer worship in their own house of worship together. They, and then that's when the wall went in and the mosque got split. And so you, to get from one side to the other, you actually have to go out, go through the old city, you can come back out again and into the other side, which we did, through a couple checkpoints. Um, Abdul's shop in Hebron. Abdul's this guy who's a point of resistance. He has a $100 million house. He said somebody offered to buy his house from him for $100 million. Apparently he did. Uh, if you're a Muslim and you sell your land in Palestine, it doesn't go over very well for you or your family with your neighbors. Um, so Abdul just laughed. He's a, a fairly resistant guy too. And his shop, right across from his shop is a checkpoint. You can't really see what's going on there, but there are four Israeli soldiers. Um, two of them actually look like they came out of maybe Ethiopian Jews or someplace like that, um, who are stopping, just random stopping young Palestinian men and making them you know, lift up their clothing and prove that they're not carrying anything with them. Um, Abdul Sun was telling us about people who, one guy who shot a political ad once who was running for the Knesset for the parliament. So he deliberately came to Abdul's shop with a crowd of supporters, grabbed his tables and threw them, turned them over. Because Abdul has become this focal point for Palestinians, he thought it would look good on his TV ad if he was attacking Abdul. So he did. And he showed us the ad. It was like, uh, and so there's another view of the $100 million home. Um, as I said, Jewish settlers have moved into the upper stories in Hebron. There's about 2,000. And that means if you're walking in the market in Hebron, sometimes they throw stuff at you. So they put netting over the top of them, which is good most of the time, but our guide said one time he took a Swiss tour through and they used paint on them. So it, didn't, it wasn't great. Um, okay, so it, now resistance is creative, right? Banksy is this artist or artist. Nobody knows who Banksy is. Because there was another guy like Banksy in the 80s, and, and he was assassinated in London. So nobody knows who Banksy is. But Banksy does this with art. Just amazing stuff that makes you stop and think. Like, clearly we're not in Kansas anymore. That is what happens, though. Um, but more about Banksy. So there's another little girl kind of or walking on a barbed wire fence. More Banksy art. A girl with a barbed wire hula hoop. Uh, kids on skateboards over barbed wire coils, a little kid's toy truck, teddy bear and submachine gun. And then we went to the Wiam Center in Bethlehem. So Banksy, um, 
is just another point of resistance. You see Banksy art all over the place. In Bethlehem, the whole wall is covered with graffiti. And um, it's just a way to make you stop and think, right? You look at that, and, and the images throw you off so much that you have to actually think about what you're in. And that's their whole point. And so I think part of what's going on with Banksy art is attacking Israeli honor. They're saying, this is what you're doing. And it's not an honorable thing to do. How can you be an honorable people? Uphold yourself by saying you have the best army in the world when this is what your army does. So I think there's that going on in this as well. I mean, you don't get a lot of, like and trying to interpret somebody else's culture is difficult. But I think in the base of an honor-shame culture, there's something deeper going on here with this art. Whoops. Uh, WIAM is a United Church partner. They're working very hard within the Palestinian community on all kinds of issues unique to the Palestinian community. They're a family-based, hierarchical, patriarchal culture. And we met with some amazing people to tell us stories about how they're trying to change that culture, particularly Lucy, who's just an amazing woman, who talked about being a woman in a Palestinian patriarchy and the work that she's had to do with her family to get them to acknowledge her right at the table. She's doing incredible work there. They're doing lots of work with women who are trying to get out of abusive relationships, who are trying to uh, change their lives. It's still a difficult culture to live in. There's no denial of that, I don't think, amongst Palestinians or anybody else. It's just a, it's their difficult culture, and they're working on it. Ah, no. Our guide said, you got to see the Waldorf Hotel. I said, Waldorf, right? Because he had a bit of an accent. He said, no, no, it's the Waldorf Hotel. I said, come on. He said, no, it's Banksy's Hotel. So we went there, and sure enough, the wall is right there. And then there's the Waldorf Hotel, and that's clearly what it's called. And in front of it, I think, is more Palestinian humor. I think that's the Palestinians saying, you know, maybe this is more what the Israelis think we are than anything else. So it's their wry, ironic, you know, they said in one of the meetings, don't, don't ever tell anybody that we're angry uh, or that we're depressed, sad people. We're depressed, happy people. <laughs> so keep that going. Um, this is a message from the director of the WIAM Center. Our words, we love to live and celebrate life. All of trees with roots deeply rooted in the ground. Uh, Sahar Var, the young Jewish woman, works for the Quakers, for the Friends. She was talking to us about the culture of militarization in Israel. She told us that they're uh, sixth in the world for selling arms, uh, number one per capita. Um, there's a report uh, that verifies what she told us. She said that one of the reasons they sell so well is they can sell proven technology, proven on a captive population. So, okay, well that's... But then I read it, it's actually in their own PR material. It's proven technology, works really well. Field tested, yeah, field tested. And it's not just arms. They also sell the technology, facial recognition technology, that's where this came from. They sell the how to gate people, they sell how to disrupt people's lives by picking them up in the middle of the night technology, they sell the drone technology. They just sold the whack of drones to the European Union to use in patrolling illegal migrants. I mean, they, they're selling a lot of population control technology and they've used the Palestinians very well. This is some kids in a private military training school getting ready to become part of the IDF, the Military Defense Force, because that's what they have to do. Um, well, most of them do. She actually told us that about just under 50% of Israeli kids actually serve in the military. The other 51% or so are exempted for one reason or another. Uh, and this was an Associated Press photographer who followed them um, and just you know, took pictures of what they were doing. This is the um, Breaking the Silence organization. It's some of those young men and women after they got out and of the military. And uh, one young man's story was, when I started to tell my family what we were doing, I started to realize there might be a problem with what I was doing. Like, you did what? <laughs> you broke into somebody's house and you did what? Why, you, why did you do that? And so he said, I started to think about that. And so they started an organization called Breaking the Silence. Um, they've got videos online too, just about what they did and how they did it and why they did it. 
And uh, they've just passed a law in the Israeli parliament that says these people can't go to an Israeli school and tell the kids anything about what they did. Not this organization. They don't want them there. Whoops. No, I'll just switch out of that. So there you go. Banned by the Knesset. Jeff Halper, he's been here. Jeff Halper's part of the uh, Israeli Committee Against Home Demolitions. And so they try and protest home demolitions to get them stopped. There have been about 20,000 homes demolished in Israel and Palestine. Um, these are Israelis against it. And there you know, are lots of Israelis against what's going on there. Um, you know, overall, the large mass of the population is either oblivious or in support of, but there are still lots of people who are opposed. And so what they're doing here is uh, helping build a home. This is one of the homes that they built with money from Jeff's last Canadian tour. They went and they built a house for this a Bedouin family. We met the family. This is kind of the neighborhood that they're in, a little different than that settlement village. And talked to them for a while. They're adding on. So far their home, is, it's been marked for demolition, but you just keep building. I mean, you can't put your life at bay. They've got lots of people living there. Also interesting, I didn't know this uh, still happened. There are three, three wives, one husband in this family configuration. So there's lots of kids and extended family. We went to Jifna. That's a small uh, Palestinian village. And we worshiped in the Catholic parish of St. Joseph there on a Saturday night. We met with Father Johnny and a lot of his congregation, and they just said, will you just please tell people what the hell's going on here? There used to be, the 20% of the population was Christian, we're down to 1% now. And it's not growth. Our kids are leaving because they're acceptable in other countries. Muslim kids aren't, and you can't live here anymore. And yet, we need to live here, this is our land. A Sabil Liberation Theology Center, another point of resistance, working with Christians particularly, first of all, to try and get those denominations together, but also they're doing wonderful things like different Bible studies to help make faith relevant and active in the day, uh, in the present day, and it's working. They're, uh, they're enlivening their faith and they're helping people find, again, those points of resistance that counter the culture without throwing rocks, they're peaceful, nonviolent, but very much resistant. They're going to stop this, but they're gonna do it in ways that finally startle the world to pay attention. There are some of the images. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Dorothy Day. And some wall hangings from Sabil. This is a Bible study facility training, and you can see they're having success across denominations. There are people from many different denominations in that training. They're excited about what's happening with their faith in their country. Really, they shouldn't be, but they are. Uh, and then there's one you know, where it's study with kids. There's Elias, who was our driver, and Ibrahim, our guide. Uh, as I said, Ibrahim won in 6,550, and uh, Elias won in a million. Elias could drive anywhere. It was just like really hairy over there, and he did a fantastic job keeping us alive. We went to Hebron. These are ordinary people. This is how people make their living. There's some glass over there that this fellow was part of. There's potters, pottery decorating, wood carvers in Bethlehem. And a poem from the Arafat Museum about homeland. And this is what I noticed everywhere I went, everywhere in that country. Like that kind of looks like Kamloops, where I used to live. But if you look closely, every one of those hillsides is terraced. And that means that somebody went out there with a shovel and a sledge and a pick and just kept doing it. And every one of them is done. And I can't imagine a people with that kind of tenacity and that kind of knowledge and willingness to live and work with their land being the people that end up on the bad side of this one. Israelis are using European techniques, European technology. They're pumping the water table dry. They've got those nice little subdivisions on top of the hills. It takes so much water just to keep going. It's just, it's not sustainable. And yet the Palestinian Museum of Natural History, um, Fayez, the farmer I showed you, they're working with the land the way they always have. Uh, they talked about just the need to, to be sustainable. Uh, a quote from Martin Luther King on the WIAM website. 
about why nonviolence has to be the way to go, because evil just perpetuates evil. Only light, only light can drive out darkness. And there's my question, how do we help love grow?